When I think about the most important automobile business stories, I think of the fight between the UAW and the Big Three. And the man who led that fight was a man named Walter Ruther. Here is his amazing life story. This man was fired from the Ford Motor Company for simply believing in a different philosophy. And Henry Ford would live to regret it. Because not long after this man was fired, he returned with an army, the United Auto Workers. And he turned Ford's beloved assembly line manufacturing system on its head forever. His name is Walter Ruther, and he fought the big three automakers and won, getting them all to make a deal with the labor union. He's credited with creating the UAW, and some say giving birth to the middle class. He stood alongside Martin Luther King Jr. during his I Have a Dream speech. He survived two assassination attempts, only to suspiciously die in a plane crash. Honestly, this may be my favorite automotive story of all time. Born on September 1st, 1907 in Wheeling, West Virginia, Walter Ruther didn't grow up like the other kids in town. He came from a socially conscious German-American family. His father, Valentine Ruther, was a horse-drawn beer wagon driver and a passionate socialist union organizer who had immigrated from Germany when he was only 11 years old. Walter's mother, Anna, was frugal and enterprising, making underwear from used flour sacks for her sons. Where most children grew up playing games and talking about what they wanted to become when they grew up, Walter, along with his four siblings, grew up listening to talks and discussions on social justice and labor rights. Thanks to their father, from a young age, Walter and his brothers were exposed to the harsh realities of the working world. At age nine, when Walter's father was blinded from an exploding bottle, young Walter was thrust into the workforce, taking odd jobs to help support his large family. And Walter learned firsthand about the lack of workers' rights and safety when a heavy industrial die fell and severed his big toe. Walter Ruther's upbringing was deeply marked by powerful lessons in racial equality. In one particular incident, Walter, alongside his siblings, witnessed a group of local boys hurling stones at African Americans as they were transported northward by train in cattle cars, the only place African Americans were allowed to sit on a train at the time. When they told their father about what they had witnessed, a man who himself had journeyed from far shores in search of a better life, Valentine gathered his children and delivered a stern warning never to engage in or condone such cruelty. In 1927, when he was only 19 years old, Walter embarked on a life-changing journey, leaving behind his hometown of Wheeling for the bustling industrial landscape of Detroit. He managed to secure a position at the Ford Motor Company as an expert tool and die maker, a job normally reserved for those with at least 25 years of experience in the field. But his unique ability to decipher complex blueprints and die at such a young age not only surprised the foreman, but also earned him a spot as one of the highest paid mechanics in the factory. But Walter didn't let his work consume all his time. He completed his high school education while working at Ford and pursued further studies at Detroit City College, known today as Wayne State University. Around this time, he also became active in civil rights. While attending Wayne State, he'd swim in a hotel pool near the campus that allowed students. The problem was is that it only allowed white students and Walter felt that this was a great injustice, so he organized students to form a picket line around the hotel, protesting the segregation. It worked, sort of. The hotel shut down the pool to all students. Working at Ford's River Rouge plant, Walter could see that the conditions were tough. Even though the factory was considered state-of-the-art and the most advanced factory in the world, the harsh conditions and discipline of the workers were brutal, as workers were treated like cattle, not allowed to talk, and the work was dangerous too. In 1929, when the stock market collapsed, sending the auto industry into a freefall, unemployment in Michigan soared, creating desperation for auto workers, many of whom had no safety net. So Walter decided to help by supporting the presidential campaign of Norman Thomas of the Socialist Party. A group led by the Communist Party that included auto workers staged a hunger march. About 3,000 people showed up to the Rouge plant. It was a peaceful march with wives and children meant to present a petition at the Ford Rouge plant requesting that people be put to work. 
But Ford's head of security then, Harry Bennett, had about 1,500 Ford servicemen, a small army, on hand at the plant. A scuffle erupted, and the Ford servicemen and the Dearborn police opened fire into the crowd. Four people were killed immediately. Many people were severely beaten. Walter was working at the Rouge plant at the time and heard what happened. He knew how tough the place could be, but when he heard that people were killed, it didn't sit well for the 25-year-old Ruther. As expected, Walter's growing involvement with social activism and support for the Socialist Party of America didn't sit well with Henry Ford, who was notoriously anti-union and highly pro-capitalistic. While Ford's official records state Walter left on his own choice, Walters insists he was fired for his opinions and socialist activities. Whatever the truth, Walter stopped working at Ford Motors in 1932. But this turn of events, rather than being a setback, became an opportunity for Walter and his brother Victor. It was the perfect moment to chase a childhood dream, one that extended far beyond the confines of their work and the boundaries of Detroit, a dream to travel the world. Walter Ruther's world tour with his brother started sometime in the early 1930s, setting off from Detroit. They worked their way through various countries, taking on jobs in factories and experiencing firsthand the diverse industrial landscapes and labor conditions around the world. They worked their way through Europe, mostly in Germany, and even extended all the way to the Soviet Union, where they lived and worked for a time in an automobile plant. And this international experience was eye-opening for Walter Ruther. In Germany especially, he witnessed the ominous rise of fascism and the chilling effects it had on workers' rights and social freedoms. In the Soviet Union, while initially fascinated with the socialist experiment, Walter eventually managed to peek behind the curtains. He saw the realities of authoritarian communism. He saw the lack of genuine trade and the suppression of workers' rights under the guise of state control. And these experiences in both Germany and the Soviet Union deeply informed his later stances against both fascism and authoritarian communism, solidifying his belief in democratic socialism and free labor unions as the best path forward in workers' rights. And by the time he returned to the United States, Walter had amassed a wealth of practical knowledge on global labor issues. It allowed him to advocate with a more objective mind since he now understood what strategies worked and what didn't. He was ready. While Walter was on his world tour, things were brewing back home. In 1935, the National Labor Relations Act was passed. Often dubbed Labor's Magna Carta, the act gave workers the right to organize unions. So Walter formed Westside Local 174 in Detroit, becoming its first president. The landscape of American labor was about to undergo a seismic shift. The UAW emerged under the umbrella of the Congress of Industrial Organizations, aimed specifically at representing the growing workforce of the American automobile industry. This industry, dominated by giants like General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler, was known for its resistance to labor unions. But not for long. Walter returned from his travels and stepped into this storm of industrial unrest, and his timing was impeccable. Almost immediately, Walter's impact was felt. His initial foray into the union activities involved organizing and participating in strikes, a direct challenge to the unyielding stance of the automotive industry's magnates. Walter Ruther's first major victory with the United Auto Workers was against Kelsey Hayes, a supplier of brake drums and wheels to the mighty Ford Motor Company. Walter knew that if he could make Kelsey Hayes fall, the rest of the companies would get the message that he was coming for them. The workers at Kelsey Hayes faced a grueling reality, the never-ending speed-up, a common practice assembly line trick where every week the assembly line was sped up just slightly, and it pushed the workers to the limits leading to severe injuries and even loss of lives on the factory floor. And the car companies couldn't care less, so long as their quotas were met. Determined to confront this situation, Walter led a surprise strike against Kelsey Hayes in December 1936. The workers executed a sit-down in the plan and refused to leave until the management agreed to negotiate. 
And this strike wasn't just a confrontation within the walls of the factory. It echoed throughout the community. When management attempted to enter the plant to dismantle the machinery, they were met with a formidable sight. Thousands of sympathizers crowding the sidewalks, standing in solidarity to block the entryways. The stakes were even higher now because the Ford Motor Company was waiting on their brake drums and wheels. After 10 days of relentless strikes, Kelsey Hayes settled. Women would receive equal pay for equal work at 75 cents an hour, the relentless pace of the assembly line would be reduced, and workers could no longer be fired for just being part of the union. The aftermath of this victory was monumental. UAW Local 174 saw its membership swell from a mere 200 before the strike to an astonishing 35,000 after. Walter now had an army, and it was time to go after the big three. After his historic victory against Kelsey Hayes, Walter locked in on his next target, General Motors. In 1936, General Motors was one of the largest corporations in the world, and it became the stage for one of the most significant labor battles in American history. Flint, Michigan was the epicenter of this struggle. Walter's brother Roy was already deeply involved there, strategizing and mobilizing workers for a shutdown that would force GM to recognize their right to unionize. The confrontation reached its boiling point on New Year's Eve 1936, when the workers initiated a sit-down strike, occupying the plants and refusing to leave. GM's response was to cut off the heat in the plant and subject them to the bitter cold, hoping the workers would give up. But at the same time, Walter orchestrated a strike at Detroit's Fleetwood plant, where GM's luxury Cadillac vehicles were manufactured. This was part of a wider movement, with support strikes igniting in California, Michigan, and Missouri. Auto workers across the nation stood in solidarity with their Flint counterparts, signaling a unified front in the face of corporate might. Back home in Flint, tensions escalated with the police attempting to move the strikers with tear gas and a rain of bullets, causing 13 men to be hospitalized. From the factory roof, workers fought back with improvised weapons like slingshot door hinges, while others turned fire hoses on the police in the frigid winter night. Things escalated to the point of Michigan Governor Frank Murphy deploying 2,000 members of the National Guard to intervene. But his aim wasn't to remove the workers, it was to bring about peace talks. In a strategic triumph, the workers gained control of the only plant in the country that manufactured Chevrolet engines. Just 44 days later, General Motors resigned to their demands, recognizing workers' right to unionize and signing its first collective bargaining agreement with the United Auto Workers. But Walter was only just getting started. After their groundbreaking victory against General Motors, Walter Ruther and the United Auto Workers set their sights on Chrysler. The year was 1940, and the battlefront had shifted. The approach this time was different, mirroring the evolving tactics of Walter's strategic leadership. The confrontation with Chrysler was less about the spectacle of sit-down strikes and more about the art of nuanced negotiation and targeted action. The UAW, flexing its growing muscle, organized a series of strategic strikes at key Chrysler facilities, a move calculated to apply just enough pressure to bring the corporate giant to the bargaining table without crippling its operations. And this series of strikes proved to be a genius idea. Chrysler, recognizing the resolve and growing influence of the UAW, gave in to many of the union's demands. The final contract was a victory, not just in terms of improved wages and conditions for the workers, but also in cementing the UAW's role as support for the often overlooked workforce. Walter Ruther's victory over Chrysler was proof of his and the UAW's ability to adapt to different situations and strategize. Two down, one to go. In the pages of American labor history, the struggle between Walter Ruther and the UAW against the Ford Motor Company stands as a particularly dramatic saga. At the heart of this narrative was Henry Ford, the industrial titan whose vehement opposition to unionization cast him as the arch-villain in the eyes of many of his workers. Ford's stance against organized labor was not just ideological, 
he made sure his workers knew the exact consequences through tangible, often violent ways. Workers who dared to voice their desire to unionize were met with fierce resistance, including intimidation, beatings, and firings. It was a crystal clear message that dissent would not be tolerated. And into this charged atmosphere stepped Walter Ruther, his resolve forged in the fires of previous labor battles. Unbothered by the monumental challenge Ford presented, he went on to organize a relentless campaign to bring union representation to Ford workers. And having worked there himself, he knew how to hit Ford where it hurts. Just a month after the landmark agreement with Chrysler, Walter sought and received authorization from the city of Dearborn to distribute leaflets titled Unionism, Not Fordism. Unsurprisingly, this act of peaceful advocacy quickly turned violent. As Walter and three fellow UAW leaders began to ascend the stairs towards the bridge at Gate 4, they were ambushed by a group of enforcers led yet again by Henry Ford's lead henchman, Harry Bennett. The attack on Walter was brutal and unrelenting. He found himself swarmed by a group of at least a dozen men who knocked him to the ground, kicking and punching him. Walter's attackers then lifted him, holding him parallel to the ground, only to slam him repeatedly onto the hard concrete. He was even thrown down three flights of stairs, his body battered with each tumble. Even as he laid injured and bloodied, the vicious beatings continued. The incident would be known as the Battle of the Overpass. But this incident only strengthened Walter's resolve. The combination of Walter Ruther's campaign against Ford was nothing short of a David and Goliath tale, a story of resilience triumphing over seemingly insurmountable odds. But Walter, armed with his intimate knowledge of Ford's operation and a keen understanding of the worker's plight, orchestrated a campaign that was both strategic and deeply empathetic. And his efforts went beyond mere negotiations. He mobilized a wave of grassroots support, galvanizing workers not just within Ford, but across the nation. He organized rallies and protests, drawing attention to the dire conditions and injustices faced by Ford workers. These events, often marked by powerful speeches and displays of unity, captured the public's attention and sympathy, gradually turning the tide of public opinion against Ford's draconian practices. At the same time, Walter worked internally to build a coalition within Ford, uniting all the workers under a single cause. He listened to their stories of hardship and struggle, and encouraged them to turn their pleas into a collective cry for justice. As Walter continued to try to organize the Union at Ford, he survived his first assassination attempt, when gunmen tried to kidnap and kill him at a party he was hosting in his home. A partygoer escaped and alerted authorities, saving Walter's life. But the negative press on Ford continued to turn public sentiment, as well as Henry Ford's wife Clara's opinion, and it was becoming clear that Henry Ford was starting to fight a losing battle. So after years of pressure, even from President Roosevelt, Henry Ford ultimately recognized the UAW in 1941, making Ford the last of the automotive giants against unionization to finally concede. The victory was profound and symbolic. Workers who had for so long lived in the shadow of tyranny celebrated their newfound freedom and the recognition of their rights. It was a victory that reverberated far beyond the walls of Ford factories, sending ripples throughout the labor movement and affirming the power of collective action. But the work wasn't over, because the war was upon them, and things would get heated and far more complicated for Walter and the UAW. In 1940, as World War II raged in Europe, the United States faced a dire situation. The production of fighter planes, crucial for aiding their allies against Hitler's onslaught, was painfully slow and inadequate. And with the Allies' security hanging in the balance, the U.S. government wanted to build new manufacturing plants for plane production, a process that would have taken two years just to begin, time the Allies simply didn't have. So amidst the pressing urgency, Walter Ruther stepped forward with a bold proposal transforming the entire unused capacity of the auto industry into a massive plane production unit capable of producing an astonishing 500 planes a day. He even got support from the workers for this plan, and he publicly announced it just before Christmas in 1940, calling it the Ruther Plan, 500 planes a day. Days later, 
Walter found himself at the White House discussing the feasibility of his plan with President Roosevelt himself. The auto companies were hardly thrilled with this. General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler preferred the government to build new factories for the post-war benefit and disliked how the workers were interfering in decisions meant for upper management to make. It wasn't until the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, that the auto companies realized that their resistance was doing more harm than good. Detroit's automobile plants pivoted to mass-producing planes and tanks, earning the city the title of Arsenal of Democracy and significantly bolstering the Allies' war efforts. By 1943, the success of this industrial transformation was obvious. Chrysler's president, K.T. Keller, reported a remarkable conversion of the company's machinery to wartime production, vindicating Walter's vision. When the war ended, Fortune magazine credited Walter's foresight and his proactive approach, comparing his way of taking action against the more passive stance of some industrialists and government agencies. Some historians say Walter's most important contribution came after the war. In 1945, as the world transitioned from war to peace, Walter led another significant strike against General Motors, this time demanding a 30% increase in wages for the workers without increasing the cost of the cars. Despite GM's refusal to comply with the wage increase, leading to a prolonged 113-day strike, the two sides eventually reached a compromise with an 18.5-cent hourly raise. And following all of Walter's victories against auto giants in America, on March 27, 1946, Walter was elected president of the UAW. It would be a position he would hold for 24 years, growing it to over 1.5 million members, the largest union in the United States. What came out of Detroit in the post-World War II period was essentially the middle class of the United States. Automotive was a very productive industry, and what the UAW did was link the idea of growing productivity to rising wages and growing benefits. Walter transformed working in the auto industry from a low-wage, part-time job of insecurity to a job that paid a living wage. He achieved worker gains that were unheard of previously, such as enhanced job security, vacations, benefits, pensions, and profit sharing. Despite Walter's potential for a higher salary, he chose to keep his earnings modest, never making more than $31,000 a year. In 1948, Walter survived his second assassination attempt. While preparing a snack in his kitchen, a double-barrel shotgun blasted through his window. No one ever found the culprit. Thirteen months later, a similar attack almost claimed the life of Walter's brother Victor. The blast would cost him his right eye and was interpreted as a menacing message to Walter. Walter was a close friend to the famous civil rights leader, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Walter committed the union financially to King's 1963 march in Detroit, and he supported the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. In 1963, Walter, Dr. King, and Reverend Franklin led 125,000 marchers down Detroit's Woodward Avenue. Dr. King had come to Detroit a week before, and Walter gave him an office to use at Solidarity House. That's where Dr. King would pen most of his I Have a Dream speech. And when Dr. King delivered the full famous speech a few months later in August 1963, Walter was on stage with him in Washington, D.C. Walter Ruther's life, marked by the relentless advocacy for workers' rights and social justice, came to a tragic end on May 9, 1970. On that fateful night, Walter his wife Mary, and four others, including two pilots, perished in a fiery plane crash. Their chartered Learjet was making its final approach to Pelston Regional Airport in Michigan, close to the UAW's facility at Black Lake, when it went down at 9.33 p.m. Eastern Time. But this was no accident. An investigation revealed that the craft had missing parts, incorrect installations, and one part was even installed upside down. The findings fueled speculation that Walter's death might not have been an accident, given his history of surviving assassination attempts and having survived another near-fatal plane crash only one year earlier. And his untimely death seemed to echo the broader pattern of the silencing of liberal and radical leadership in America, much like the deaths of JFK, Malcolm X, 
and Martin Luther King Jr. Walter's story is not just a chapter in the history of the American labor movement. It's a testament to the power of collective action and the enduring spirit of solidarity in the pursuit of justice and equality. But there are two sides to every story. And if you're interested in learning about the Ford Motor side of the story, then you can check out this video on Henry Ford's henchman, Harry Bennett, whose story is also amazing and that you can watch right here, right now. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you'll subscribe and explore my other videos on this channel. And if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to leave a like and I'll see you in the next one.